Hey, welcome to Vice Grip Garage. I picked up this 1970 Evinrude Skeeter snowmobile for $350. Looks like it hasn't run since 2005. So I'm just going to get her fired up and tootling around again. Which is a pretty bold statement considering I've never even owned an Evinrude snow machine. And I know nothing about them. That's... That's fine. Thin curiosity is just biting on you right now. The reason I picked this machine up here is I've got three boys and as much as I hate to admit it, they're just growing like a patch of wild clover. Dang it. I've got two other classic Yamahoo machines. I mean they don't run either but that's a story for another day. But anyway, eventually they're gonna say that's not fair. I need my own. And there's no way I'm going to go mortgage some new pile of plastic that looks like an alien designed it. My kids are going to learn patience and perseverance just like I did, but being stranded in some stubble field 20 below, pulling on that rope hoping it starts so they can survive. So I found this here machine on the interwebs and bought it sight unseen and picked it up just a couple days ago. Again, I've never worked on an Evinrude other than an outboard boat motor. Those seem fairly straightforward, but we'll just kind of gander around this unit, see what we got, drink it in, and we're going to have to just tear into it and see if we get this thing fired up. Well, first things first, let's get into the stickers on this. We've got a Minnesota Department of Natural Resources from 96, but we've got another tag up here from 05, so... One can assume that she's been sitting off the trail for 15 years. Maybe she's been started since then. My guess is someone let it sit from 96 and then they fired her back up in 05 and that was pretty much that. But we'll go around her and cover the basics. Look at this thing. That is majestic. I mean, you can't beat the styling of 70s and 80s snow machines. Early 80s, not late. Of course, everybody knows that Evinrude means angry sailboat. And down here it says 25. If you look quickly, you might think that says 125, but that's wrong. 25 stands for 25 horsepower. We'll get to that here in a little bit. We got some really cool controls. Compression release. This is a big boy now we're playing with. I'll show you in a minute. You need this to start it. Over here you've got the warm-up control, which is a super fancy way to say this is a choke. Primer, mandatory. Neutral lockout, we'll get to that in a little bit. And then this is where the reverse lever would be. So we'll talk about that right now. This is what you call a, I think it's an E1500 is the model number. And what that means is the track is 15 and a half inches wide. Then they had what everybody calls the wide track, which is the 2000. And then they had a 2005 model, which I believe the only difference literally was the 2005 had the electrotronic starts, which this one doesn't. See, it just, it doesn't do anything, even though it says start. What's weird about that is the length and overall width of the machine does not change from the 1500 to the 2000 series. So that's that's pretty interesting. The reason I bought this is the engine. It's really unique. We'll get there. Just wait. Patience. All right? I got to show you something even cooler. Look at this pipe. What is this, you ask? What's this doing? 
How come it's, why is it back here? Are these pipe fittings? I'm not sure. But wait, is it on this side too? Yep, it is. All the way up. Look at that. Someone took the exhaust, made custom duels. Well, it's technically two under one. And she comes back here and then dumps right there. So she's got custom exhaust that comes out back here. When these are cold and that exhaust dumps up here, plus the this is a two stroke, lots of smoke, you know, right into the long wind bags. Looks like a long drawn silver seat. You know, she's flayed open a little bit, but I'll show you how to fix this for about three bucks. Oh, look at that, it comes right back around. No one will even notice that. Got the original hand grips. I mean, it's in pretty decent shape overall. I did look at the track a little bit when I first brought this to the shop. So I'll show you that video clip right now. That seems to be, I mean, it's worn, but it's not tearing or ripping. All the bogies seem to be fairly decent. Track might need an adjustment, but that's not a big deal. Or out of the norm. Inside lugs aren't ripped off. A little bit of a tear there. It's best just to get those off on there too. So this side is chunking a little bit. So we might have to take a look at that up there and see what's going on and then there's a closer look at this exhaust. That's pretty unique. Both sides it's run like that. And then dumps out on the back here. Now we'll get to the actual reason I bought this here fine specimen. And that's the engine itself. And I am admittedly an Arctic cat. Or a Yamahu guy growing up. My grandpappy used to sell Arctic cats, at least that's what I was told before I was even born. And growing up on the farm, there was just kitty cats. Every, the El Tigres and the Panthers and whatever else. The first machine my dad bought me when I was way too small to ride a 440 was an Arctic cat. And my brother used to come out and save me 74 miles from home in shorts and pull start that thing for me. Thanks, Chris. I just didn't have the horsepower to get that thing over. Anyway, this is a 437 cc 7 to 1 compression opposed two stroke two cylinder engine. How is your brain now? Because mine's going. Let's get this hood open and dig into this thing. All the latches are already just ready to rip. By the way, don't go spend $150 on snowmobile dollies and all that stuff. Just go get a $20 furniture mover from Harbor Freight and this works just fine. Here we go. Look at this thing right here. Does that belong in an airplane? Wrong. It belongs in this snow machine. I just can't believe it. And it looks to be in pretty good shape. I did put about 17 gallons of engine degreaser in here but it came around pretty good. But you can clearly see the opposed two cylinder, spark plug there, spark plug there, single fuel make it happen or here. And everything looks to be in pretty good shape. I did take the air cleaner off when I bought it. I just wanted to make sure that all of this was functioning and looked fairly decent-ish-ish -ish and surprisingly looks really clean in there. I don't know why, but it does. Look at that. They went on to build a lot of boats. We got dual coils down here. And of course the exhaust, we talked about that. And that really is the only thing changed on the sled that I can tell from you know the factory position. But we'll kind of start looking into this thing. We'll start with some engine components. We'll get into the drive box and the belts and see if we can figure out Apparently there's a sequence of operation. So let's hook our peepers in a little bit closer here. We'll start here with the 
pulley and assembly that's hooked right to the crankshaft of the engine here. And this is basically your clutch unit, your centrifugal clutch. And this might be on some other sleds, but I'm just not familiar with it because I'm an Articat guy and I haven't seen this. It's a pretty neat feature. And what this cable does, if I pull it over here, it's a neutral lockout. So this just depresses this pin and the spring. And now you can idle it and free rev it, and it's not going to engage this belt. And this is hooked directly to the sled. So if I roll this, the sled will actually move. See, there you go. So you can warm it up this way. And then you could pop it out of the neutral lock and now this clutch will move and the belt will walk up and you can actually move this out. This pulley is hooked to a chain here in this case. This belt, based on the owner's manual, I know is from 1991. And that looks to be wrapped in like a kid's sled maybe, some kind. But here on the 1500 model, there's a chain in here and it's enclosed. On the wide track or the 2000 or 2005 model, the chain is actually exposed and you can see the idler pulley and all of that. This is the adjusting wheel. So you run this forward, back these nuts out, and then spin this here counterclockwise and that will tighten the chain tension. You just tighten it finger tight and lock this back down. We'll be sure to check that. Uh, these drive pulleys are definitely going to need to be cleaned up. We'll run a cheek poker on that. When they're rusted and pitted like this, you're going to get a lot of slip. And a lot of folks will say, I don't have any power. The sled just doesn't have any guts. And a lot of that is belt slip, actually. And this is a NAPA. So this has been replaced several times, at least. But everything is here, it's put together. The brake pads look decent. This is a disc brake style. This is significantly loose. You can see the movement there. But the good news is this is super easy to adjust and I could tell no one's done it. All you do is pull this cotter key out, run this castle nut down until there's friction here on the pulley, which is completely nothing back it off a quarter turn or to the nearest pinhole, run this pin back in. Then you can use this to adjust the brake handle up here. And it looks like what they've been doing, and I know for a fact that from the factory, this nut is usually way up here. And look at the spring, it's just completely collapsed. So what they've been doing is they've been trying to make all of the adjustment up here instead of actually adjusting it here. Well, if you've been watching the channel a while, you know that one of the biggest things that drives me to save all these classics, whether it's a car, truck, boat, motorcycle, snow machine, is all the history behind it and the stories that they could tell. I mean, if only they could have a voice. Blake Shelton, bad music, good host. Anyway, this particular machine came with the original owner's manual and in it, you could tell it's an old timer's writing because they just had better penmanship back in the day. There's just a ton of notes almost on every single page in here, which is really cool. And digging through this, I could see that um, he's had some starting problems, clogged vent, mixture was too lean, bad plugs, air leak somewhere, question mark. Uh, had a primer bulb issue, he changed the fuel mixture to 50 to 1. We'll talk about that in a bit. Not really liking that too much. And then there's some notes on this page about the sparkulators. In 86, so 16 years after he owned it, he changed it from a J&J &J plug to a J&C, which is a champion model. And it looks like in 1991, I think I replaced the plugs. Okay. That was probably the last time. But there's a lot of good information on here, mainly chain drive, track maintenance, things like that. So I'm gonna use this to kind of follow along. And this has a lot of pictures in it, which is great because I read bottom to top, right to left. And pictures just help a guy out. So I think where our guy is gonna start is right on the fuel tank. There's a little bit of fuel in there. It smells really bad which I'm used to. But 
Two strokes are really particular with fuel and fuel mixture. And going back to earlier, there were some handwritten notes in there. It was like 50 to one question mark or 40 to one. But the manual and right on the tank says 24 to one mixture is absolutely needed. My guess is they were fouling plugs and thought it was too heavy oil in the fuel mixture and they ended up changing the plugs. I think it was a 91 we just said, I can't remember. Anyway, I think they were chasing a problem and the issue was actually the plugs and not the fuel. My hope is they didn't wear out this engine in the rings by running it too lean of oil because in a two stroke, your oil and the fuel is actually what lubricates the piston and rings at the top end of the engine. So let's get that off, clean it out, see what's in it, see if we can see any oil in it, fingers crossed. By the way, this is really, really unheard of. If you're into snow machines, especially vintage snow machines, I am legitimately the third owner. And as a 1970, that's mind blowing. Usually someone pays it off in three years and then they sell it. And then every season thereafter, or every two seasons, it goes to a new owner. So when you buy a snowmobile, it's really common that it's had 15, 16, 17 owners. So tracking the history and the maintenance of it is really near impossible. But this machine, there was a guy before me, had it for a couple of years, and that was basically it. And then there was the original owner. So that's pretty nifty. My eyeballs are telling me bolt, bolt, bolt. I'm sure it's the same on the other side. It is. And then we've got obviously the fuel line on the inside, but I think we can pull the tank back and then disconnect that. The winterizing procedure in the manual actually tells you to remove this tank every single year and empty it out. This seat's brand new, but I think I'm gonna take that off as well and that'll make sliding this tank back easier. Plus, I might, I mean, because I might be getting carried away, but maybe we shine on all this you know, with the whirly woo and some sort of cream. And with the seed off, that'll be a lot easier. So I'll grab some ranches and get to this thing. Oh, it does have a little drainer roo there and she does have some newer RTV. So my guess is, looking at this, they've just been draining it here, which is not adequate because look at how high this is relative to the bottom of the tank. So we could have a lot of crud in here it's hard to say. It's too bad about this. The rest of the machine is pretty good, but obviously I couldn't buy it without some sort of rust. My youngest Bentley's with today. He learned we had the snow machine and he would not stay home. He had to come with and help. So I got him taking the fuel tank off here and I'm gonna go find a socket that'll fit that fuel line way back in there because the guy's just not going to be able to fit a roo driver back in there. And I think we'll take the fuel make it happen or off as well. This might be a Bendix carb, I'm not quite sure, but we should probably take that and clean it up and maybe even look at the diaphragm in here, make sure that's all good. And over lunch, I'll, I'm going to try to pick up some new fuel lines too. These are just rock solid and they're not going to be fun getting on or off and you can always tell when they get this yellow orange color it's time to replace them these are supposed to be clear so i'll probably do that as well and i think i have some of this little quarter inch line the rubber from the snow machine yet if a guy's looking for a snow machine just look for the ones that say don't run or non-running or this and that just like any small engine 99% chance it's going to be fuel related and folks just get so worked up about taking these fuel make it happeners apart and they're really not difficult at all. So take a gamble, go pick one up, grab a carb kit and just get into it. I don't even have a carb kit for this one. We're just going to try to do some surgery on it, save on the gaskets if we can. And then if I have to, I'll just let this sit in pieces for two weeks while I wait to find a carb kit for it. That seems to make sense. Okay, the thing is off, whatever that did. What's next? Not sure. There's a bolt there. Okay. And then over here I got three more bolts, and then this guy should come out. 
Um, always make sure your vents are working on, see this one was closed. Always make sure your vents are working when you're running this kind of fuel pump. If it's not venting properly, you're not gonna suck a late fuel very good. How you coming, bud? Good, I'm on my last bolt. Well, you got three more over here still, remember? Oh. Yeah, you just have to switch sides. He busted out his toolkit here. You know, he's growing his own collection, got some safety goggles. You got scissors even? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Nice high quality set of sockets there. All right, get that out of there. Oh, we got some weight reduction. Oh, it's not too bad. Yeah, it is. Couple holes. Well, now I know this was meant to be. She's got some weight reduction on her. Some of this is just starting. And then there's pinholes. We got a couple holes back here. So I'm probably gonna take the cheek poker and the retina ruiner and just kind of clean this up a little bit and gonna have to try to save on it because once these tunnels go, the sled's pretty much shot. I have rebuilt one of these, but it takes measuring and angles and diagrammical engineering and basically it's a whole lot of work. So I'm just gonna try to save on it a little bit if I can. I get this tank slid back. Now I got easier access to this right there. So I'm seeing a lot of this copper wire holding down fuel lines in here and I like it. Definitely could have drank beer with the previous owner. Go ahead and get this off Bentley. Shake her around a little. There's some juice in there. We can use that to our advantage. A lot better shape under this, which is good. Even had the original rubber seal over here. Missing over here, that's okay. Now I can pull this whole fuel line out, which will have a little filter in it and have a line, should have a line to the primer as well, which is this guy right here. This hole, the 2005 E's, not only did they have the electrotronic digital start, but I think there was a lever here for a reverse actually, because they were a little bit heavier of course. More wire, perfect. Got the fuel line out, and this was kind of like this to the tank, and then this came up here to what we'll refer to as the pump. Filter in it, we'll definitely replace it. I can't even see through that thing. And then this right here is a fitting that goes up to the primer. And that's this line here. And basically what you're doing is you're drawing fuel from the tank and then you're snipping it into the intake directly over here. And that's for your cold starts. And then you can use what they call the warm up control. Like that, and she should fire off. Or just jam two cans of huffing gas down the intake here, and that should fire it off. So now we got that out of the way. I think I bent this, that's fine. Oop, more wire, that's good. So now we'll get all of this kind of off, and pretty much everything I'm touching in here is more brittle than Betty White's back. So we gotta be a little careful, but not much. We'll get it out. And then we got some cable laters and some other stuff. We're gonna have to really pay attention how all that goes in there. Cause I just get in a hurry and start snipping and then putting her back in. I just, I can't know. a guy who doesn't have a plan. That's weird. I think I'm gonna change up the processes here. I'm gonna clean up this tunnel, get rid of all this rust, treat it, prime it, paint it. That way that's just drying while we're cleaning up the fuel tank then hopefully we can get everything put back together quicker that way. So we'll start by shop vacuuming this. We'll get the cheek poker out. Maybe we got a sand on it. Don't know what we're getting into. I know that I would really like to not weld today, if possible, but we'll see what happens.
Well, I feel like this is a part in the soap opera when the doctor, who's clearly never even picked up a knife in his life, walks into the waiting room. Well, it's, it's not good news. I've got rust coming through in places I never imagined. And I think if we're gonna do this, let's just cut it out, put some fresh metal in there, and just get it done. Yeah, we're gonna do that before we even make it run, because that's the right thing to do. No, not even close. Here's what we're up against. Guy cleaned it up, and this is why you should always just clean on it when you got some weight reduction or you suspect you have some. Because it just ends up being a lot worse once you get all that bubbled stuff off. Basically, this whole area of the tunnel is just shot. And then back here in the corners, which is to be expected because this is where all the slush, you know, she always picks up. The old Arctic Cats the fuel tank was back here actually, set up up here. And this spot always rotted out. But each corner you can kind of see a line. I think I can get some fresh metal there here this is going to be not so good but i got this piece back here that's solid that i could tie into and then i think i'm going to take this whole chunk out here if i had the material and the patience i would just chop it from here and bring it all the way down to the end and just do the whole tunnel but i don't so here's what we got now i could lap this i've got a pneumatic lapping tool but this doesn't need to be flush so I'm going to cut a sheet out that's close to this dimension. I'll mark that out. And then I'm just going to leave an inch lip all the way around. And we're just going to lap or overlap weld this new piece into this old piece once I get that cut out. And then I've got some Duplicolor paint. It's not perfect, but it'll closest itch matches you, sir. And then over here, we'll treat on this too. See if we can convert her over, you know. And then we'll paint on it there. And this is the color we got. It's four dark blue. And I don't know. I mean, it might. It's close enough. It's under the seat, except for that side. Now I just gotta decide, you know, do we do the whole tunnel and over? I'd hate to lose these graphics over here, but with the exhaust being hacked in, it's not like it's, you know, cherry original or anything like that. But we've definitely got to slow this down or we've only got a couple of years left and this whole tunnel is going to be rotted. So we'll start by grabbing this sheet, cutting out some pieces, and then we'll start cutting into this tunnel. Got some pieces sliced out and I think them will work. We'll snip them right in here. Nice thing is this is all leftover material from making my own pans in the Chevelle for independence. So no cost there. And they're not perfectly square, but that's okay. Bentley insisted on using his square. I think it's fine, construction grade. So what we've got here is the, the yellow is where I'm gonna cut. And then the red is the actual outline of the piece of material we're putting in. So there'll be a lip here that we can set it on for a little bit of, I don't know. What are we calling it? Strength? I guess so. Back here, the same thing. A little bit dicey down here on the edge. What I'm gonna do now is take the lightning scissor and, and then after I get done slicing this out, and hopefully not light the track on fire, which is right there, then we'll get the grinder disc out and see if we can get some stuff in our eyes, clean this up real nice, and get ready to weld her down. What is that? Oh, this is going fairly well. Got some, uh, maybe I should make this a hatch and do some sort of track inspection. I can't see the track is too loose, so we're gonna have to fix on that in a little bit. Also got a better view back here. 
There's actually a muffler on this thing. I'll be dipped. I thought it was straight piped. The rumor is the previous owner, the old timer, was an engineer. And he came up with this design here. And by the looks of it, I'm going to go on ahead and believe that. But this worked pretty good. Uh, this is, I used a yardstick kind of as a guide. You can see what that looks like. And then this is freehand. So there's a couple different ways you can use that lightning scissor. Stuff like this that you don't see, it don't really matter, but it's just easier to go down a two by four or something you got laying around. Got a support bar across here. Of course, I wanted to leave these bolt holes here. One is for the tank and one's for the seat. So that's why I didn't want to get this up and around in here. Now we're going to have an issue down here. I haven't decided what I'm going to do and I probably will never decide it. But I don't think I'm going to get a weld in there. She might just have to float a little bit. But that's going to be better than having rotten metal back in here. So now I'll just take the grinder and just get me some fresh metal in here. So we have something nice to weld to. Get some weld through primer laid down and blast these patches in. And then we can maybe move on to cleaning the tank like we were two hours ago. Well, a guy and a little human guy are working our way through this stuff. And we're kind of wandering around and trying to get all this surface rust off and trying to expose these pits. Because we're going to put a converter in here and try to, you know, flip this over. Got a little bit more here to do. And then Bentley's going to get over there and you're going to get this foot pad cleaned up, right? Mm -hmm. All right, it better look brand new when you're done. So is it, should it look like this shiny? Yeah, it should be real shiny. I think we're ready to start putting this thing back together. She looks like a jigsaw puzzle. That's fine. I used some duplicolor rust converter and just sssst, pretty much everything. That's dried up. Before I get to welding, I'm gonna lay down this duplicolor weld through primer here. Pretty much for all the exposed metal and anywhere that I'm gonna be welding or any metal that's gonna be overlapped basically. We wanna control the moisture under there so it just doesn't start rusting again immediately. That'd be nice. Well, this is all drying up here. I'll grab all the pieces that we got ready and put them in the vise and just kind of deburr them and clean them up a little bit. Then when this is dry, we'll be ready just to rock and roll here. Got this thing all stitched up. I'm gonna use my stability tester 200 and make sure the strength is there, you know? Yeah, it passed. You probably noticed I did most of it in about two inch stitches instead of what you would do on like body panels where you jump around and just spot weld. That keeps your heat under control so you don't get any big warps. You might have also noticed a little bit more splatter than usual. I had the heat turned way down and also my gas a little bit lower than usual. 
Now we don't have any big warps in this. Not that it matters, because it's just a tunnel, but you know. I'm gonna hit it with this primer from Duplicolor. It's self-etching. This is really ideal for bare metal and also creates a lot of adhesion for us. So we'll kind of just mist this on, let that dry, and then we're gonna hit it with that color. I think I'm actually gonna run a tape line, believe it or not. I'll be dipped. To make sure my $74 million painter's tape sticks, why does that cost so much? Anyway, I'm gonna hit it with some Ace Freely sauce here. That'll clean up any dirt and debris and that tape will just stick on there real nice. I gotta find some rags. You don't need a lot of this juice because it's pretty expensive. Just get a little in here. There we go. Yeah. Oh, now I'm just getting spit on it. These tape lines aren't perfectly straight because the guy had to snip down here and there to get kind of the rest of the rust and stuff, but it doesn't really matter. All this is going to get covered up with the seat anyway. The blue is not a perfect match. I think it's gonna dry a little bit darker, but again, with that seed on, it don't matter. We know it's good underneath and gonna last a few years. Anybody can just get this thing running and go banging around for one or two more seasons, but I want it to stick around for a good while and this should hopefully help with that. Anywho, this time change has just got me wrapped up sun's coming down didn't expect that i think we're going to clean up for tonight and call it off this has got to dry anyway tomorrow jessica and the other two boys are coming out so we'll really just tie this thing in a bow quickly start with the fuel tank fuel make it happen or the pump and if she runs which i think we can make that happen we're going to reupholster the seat put some shine on this thing and it's going to look like a brand new machine see you in the morning what do you got going on here? Um, we're gonna launch a rocket. A rocket? Yeah. Did you build this thing? Yeah, I built it yesterday. How is it powered? There's a little engine on the bottom here. Okay, and you got some sort of wires yeah. running? I'm gonna take the safety cap off. All right, well, let's fire it up. Don't you gotta plug the wires in? Careful now. Don't get electrocuted. Okay. Is it wired right? Yes. Okay, are you going to give us a countdown? Um, sure. Okay. Three, two, one. We've got failure to launch. Oh, your leads might have been loose, huh? Everybody get back. This is going to be big. Okay, I'm honestly pretty impressed. <laughs> I have no idea where it went. We need like 15 of these just... I know. Keep them running all day, right? Seriously. Anyway, back to the snow machine. Jessica and the kids are here, obviously. They're going to help today. All of you know that Jessica's kind of the interior know-it-all buff queen. Princess? Good worker person? She does, she does the interior stuff. So I want you to take this seat, Jessica, and I need restoration quality, like classic vintage look. Mm -hmm. Just, I need it to be good, okay? Okay. And while she's doing that, I'm gonna hand polish up the tunnel and the bottom of the sled here kind of gets shine coming out before we put what I assume is gonna be a brand new seat back on here. And then we're finally back to the tank and getting the rest of it done. You have high hopes. I used some Mystic Wizard cut and I just used my hand, started polishing in the sides of the tunnel and then it kind of eats into the different blue, the Ford blue that we got on here. It's close enough, and again, you're never gonna see this under the seat, but it's starting to come around a little bit, and it's cleaned up. Will definitely give us a couple more years of use this way. We won't have to worry about this rot out. Guy doesn't want his hind end to drop into that track, that's for sure. I gotta figure out where we put that fuel tank. We'll start cleaning it. Oh. It's right there. I wonder if a guy can just use the juice that's already in this tank to clean it up. And I think I can. I got a box of 916 nuts here that I'll probably never use. And I still can afterwards anyway. 
But I'm just gonna dump all these in here, shake it around a lot, and those nuts will break loose any corrosion or surface rust inside the tank. And then I'll dump it out and just flush it a couple times, and that should work pretty good. Okay, I got that seat done. Here, come and check it out. Oh, already? Yeah. All right. Jessica said she's got this seat done already, so let's go check it out. Restoration quality. Oh, it's blue. Oh, <laughs> yep. Is this poverty chrome? It is, in blue. Oh, man, it's perfect. You really came through on this one. Yeah. There's a reason we get along. Yeah. Good I job. Have, I had to bust out my good skills here. So most of the old snow machines will have a dial here. And all that runs on is just this cork piece here. And as it raises, I don't know if you could see that, just a twirling away in there like a merry-go-round. But that's what moves your gauge. This is really rusted and corroded. And this thing is not going to float correctly. So I'm going to put this on the cheek poker hook to the bench and just... Nip, nip. Clean that up, hopefully. I got $77 of hardware in the tank, so I'm just gonna shake on that. And not sure where we're gonna dump that. Probably in an environmentally friendly container outside. Oh. <coughs> you don't wanna shake it too hard, apparently. You wanna have me that lid? I can't I handle the it. smell. I can't smell it over here. I'm not saying locked. I'm gonna see if I can find a way to dump this into something where you guys can see it. So what I'm gonna do is take this and just dump it into here. This is already dirty. We're not gonna be able to see the sediment, but at least you get the color effect anyway. This is one of the smelliest tanks we've had in a long time. Oh yeah, that's... Yeah. that? Oh. That's the pickup tube, or was the pickup tube, that ran into the tank. I'm glad we did this because that was never going to work. This completely squished. Look at the sock. Fully corroded. This most certainly had a fuel delivery problem. And now that I can see in this tank, it's really bad. I'm going to have to do that a couple times. And then we'll back this out. There should be a fitting, and we'll have to put another hose in there with the sock on it because this one is just, it's down. Look at that, plugged completely solid. So this is the second time I've flushed it now. So the contents of this pan I emptied out, and it was clean when I dumped it in the second time. So this is legitimately what is coming out of the tank. And it's like a rusty mud. Sure wish all that was gold flake. But I'm gonna clean the nuts up, put it in the tank, keep going. We've used about three gallons of gas now. Uh, it's getting a little bit better, but I'm glad we flushed this. There was no way this was gonna run on this tank. A lot of stuff in here of this lip is kind of preventing that from coming out. I might have to pop this drain and see if I can get some of it out of that. You can also use marbles. Mile 17 Walmart. You get a bag for like two bucks and you can dump them in here. These have a little bit sharper of an edge, but not everybody has this many big bolts laying around. So, when the old lady goes to Walmart, just have her pick up a bag of marbles. Is this now the fourth time? Yep. So I'm gonna run this through the wheel here. I gotta be really careful not to damage this cork. And then we need to test this vent as well. <sighs> Which is plugged. So that also would cause fuel flow issues because we're running a vacuum pump. Which I'll explain here in a little bit. You 
can see here it's a little bit better and this already moves tremendously easier but I'll get some emery cloth in here and clean this up and then I got I could probably run this through one more time but it's got to slide smoothly on here so that fuel see this should easily drop to the bottom and it doesn't so that fuel the buoyancy will actually make this needle turn where was I looking at I just oh right there so you guys are probably aware this shop is in BFE, Wisconsin. I mean, she's just, it's out there. I called around 150 miles, square mi circle miles, radiuses. Anyway, I used the, in the map and the, the phone book thing. And no one's got what I need, the little filter on the pickup tube. Also, unfortunately, this vent is plugged and this is pretty much hermetically sealed not really worth my time trying to do surgery on that so i need the capillator fuel riser up or downer i need that screen in the tank as well i'm gonna have to google machine that up tonight see if i can bring that in on the line you know so i think a guy's just gonna jump right in on the fuel make it happen there and a vacuum fuel pump there and that way if i need any parts i could just order everything up at once bring her on in but one way or another, I'm gonna get this thing to fire today. So this little doodabby majigger thingy here is actually a, basically a vacuum fuel pump. And there is in from the tank, there's out to the fuel make it happener, and then one from here usually goes to the in-tank plenum or the crankcase. And how this works is basically positive and negative pressure from the rise and fall of the piston. And that pressure hooks into here and there's a little diaphragm in here and that creates a sucking action it gets your fuel from the tank brings it in and pushes it right into the fuel make it happener usually these have a screen on both sides for fuel in and fuel out kind of like another pre-filter and then in the center here the older units will have like a plastic kind of like a coke bottle plastic um, that's flexible then the new ones will have like a metal diaphragm with rubber around it and that basically just pushes in and out. We'll take this apart. What I'm hoping is it was never ran on that kind of fuel that was in the tank and that's just from sitting for the last 15 years. And this is clean because it's one less part that I gotta try to clean or buy. I'm trying to keep the cost down on this thing as much as possible. Dang screws are longer than a cattle trailer. Hey, clean. And this is old style. So this is what it looks like, screen, screen. You can hear that clicking, that's that moving up and down. So this is in really good shape and I didn't ruin the gasket on this. I'll be dipped. So I'm gonna pretend we didn't even take this apart, just put her back together, pop it in and rebuild. time a guy changes my water this looks like mud so this is actually a Tillotson carb haven't been into a ton of these but they all work relatively the same this is a diaphragm that sits on here and I believe it's late enough in the year I couldn't be wrong but this looks like the newer style to me with the metal disc and this looks intact and not too dirty which is another good sign it looks to me like the needle and seat have been replaced I'll try to get in on this needle see that green this was stuck in the seat and that's another sign of ethanol fuel and that was stuck in there so I had to kind of beat it out and blow into the inlet and I did get it free but everything else looks relatively clean so I think I can soak this run some carb cleaner through that clean it up clean up the needle there and then just reassemble this it was able to save the diaphragm and gasket so that's good news uh, the inside looks really clean. Not going to have to do much there. Might run just some fine uh, SOS or something over this, emery cloth. It's kind of gummy. Clean that up just a little bit, but slap that thing back in here in just a minute. Craigslist rebuild complete. Brand new parts, everything. Thoroughly gone through, spec, 
bench load, tested, ready to rock. What do you got going on over here? I'm taking this off. Oh, okay. Did you change the plug today or just check it? I checked it. Does it look good? All right. Taking your flag stand off, huh? I don't have a flag for it. Okay, well, have fun. Over here, we got the shield make it happen or back on. Chocolaters on, or excuse me, the warm up control. I got to find a tiny little cotter key split pin nail for this. Should be good to go. And then I started thinking, you know, I don't want to have 47,000 of these hose clamps. I'll kind of show you, I think I got some in here. They had on here like this. I just no i need to keep these for something else so i'm also going to try to interweb up some of the original style banjo clamps friction clamps you know the boing boing ones that they just slide on here and you can never get off when they're cold i need that but i think i will loosely mount this in at least so i can see what we're aiming for as far as tubage goes easy over there Guy's getting impatient. I want to hear this thing run. Probably should check on the lightning cylinders down here, but we're going to do it all in one shot. I mix this up heavy on the oil. And that way, if it don't fire, at least we're lubricating the top end. I'm just going to shoot some of this in, you know, hand injection, and give her a couple pulls and see if we can at least get it to fire off. If the guy can get to it fast enough with the bottle, we might be able to just keep feeding it. Compression, release, on, mission on, neutralis and lockout, warm up control, here is some juice. Almost. Not so much warm up control, more fuel. The sheaves sound good. I don't hear any clanking or clanking over there. Neutral lockout didn't work at first, but then, you know, she came around eventually. That's great news. We got lightning. It's going to run just fine. But now I got to get some parts in. We need some clamps. We need that pickup tube filter. We need a fill cap. A couple other little things. Might even pick up an air, air filter for it. So I'll go home and chop all that stuff up. That's going to do it for this video. Stay tuned for part two, hopefully coming up very soon. We'll see if we can get the tank back on this thing, get it all put back together. And even if we don't have snow, we're just going to test on this thing. See you later.